Hi, and welcome um, to our program this evening. I'm sure you're going to find that it's going to be very informative. Uh, my name is Christine Plantier, and I am going to be your moderator for this evening. Um, this program is brought to you by the South Bay Survivorship Consortium, um, and the interested parties involved in that are Torrance Memorial Medical Center, Torrance Memorial Physicians Network Cancer Care, California Hematology Oncology Medical Group, Cancer Support Community, American Cancer Society, Beach Cities Health District, Kaiser Permanente South Bay, and Harbor UCLA. And this group began in 2009 and had been providing survivorship education since 2010. So that's a really great thing. Um, please visit um, our art exhibit out in the lobby, Oncology on Canvas, um, brought to us by Lily Oncology. <clears throat> and we thank Christine Souter and Lily for their ongoing support. Please vi visit our resource tables over here. Um, during the break or after the program, and the tables are sponsored by Torrance Memorial, Cancer Su Support Community, and Medtronic. Our program tonight, as most of you know, is cancer and post-traumatic stress. Not all wounds are visible. The goal of our program tonight is to provide you with information to help you recognize and manage cancer-related PTSD. We're pleased to have four excellent speakers join us and share their expertise and insight. There's a couple of housekeeping items. The bathrooms are out the door and over to the right. Please turn off your cell phones or silence them. Um, we will have a short break between the second and the third speakers. Um, you can use that to stretch, go to the bathroom, visit the tables, visit the art exhibit. And our next program will be in 2020. And please make sure that you sign or complete the evaluation form with your name, address, um, or email on that so that we can make sure that you're, you're aware of that. Hmm. Okay, what's at your seat? The handouts today are related um, to our program. Other information is available at the tables. Again, please complete the evaluation form. It's very important for us to know what information, what topics you're interested in, and that's how we base the programs that we have. Um, please return them to the volunteers as you leave this evening. And I'll thank you in advance for that. Um, yes, okay. The program tonight is being recorded and along with previous programs is available on the website. Tonight, we'd like to thank Lilly Oncology for their terrific art display and bottled water, Christine Souter. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Refreshments tonight are provided by Holly Duran from Intuitive Surgical and Toby Shawedi and um, consortium members and volunteers who helped bring this program together tonight. And Mitchell Yi, who is our media guru. Okay. And now I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Donna Ellers. Dr. Ellers knew she wanted to become a physician when she was in high school. Her major in college at UCLA was biochemistry. And now she has a subspecialty with pharma, psychopharmacology. Her med, in medical school, she believed that she would go into fam, family practice medicine. However, Dr. Ellers found her love for psychiatry during her first rotation in the specialty. She says it is deeply gratifying to see the emotional and spiritual progress of each of her patients as they make an effort to understand their lives. She finds great reward into helping people incorporate tools that can create opportunities and uplift one's spirit to live their best life. 
Dr. Ellis has been a practicing psychiatry for more than 30 years and has been a partner with Kaiser Permanente for more than 25 years. She is bilingual and bicultural with a focus on holistic healing of the body, mind, and soul. As someone who says she is in pursuit of perfection for herself, Dr. Ellers enjoys the study of Eastern religions, the practice of yoga, which, has been, which she has been involved for more than 40 years. She likes to combine the best of the East with the best of the West in philosophy. Born and raised in Southern California, Dr. Ellers has been traveling, enjoys traveling, riding her bike, hiking the hills of Palos Verdes, along with her dog, Keva. I hope I said that right. <laughs> and um, reading inspiring biographies. These, along with staying grateful and positive for each experience in her life allow Dr. Ellers to create a consciousness that is aware of the beauty of each moment. What a beautiful biography. And now, Dr. Ellers. Welcome to all of you, and what a great crowd we have, and quite a lot of people, and I want to thank you. I thank you so much. Can you hear me now? Okay, thank you. Welcome, and thank you for um, taking the time to come and learn about this topic and have a nice dinner. And so what we're going to talk about tonight is post-traumatic stress disorder as it relates to cancer, and we're going to talk about embracing fear with compassion. And uh, um, a way to visualize this sometimes is to think about a grandchild. Some of us are at that age now. We have grandchildren. And when our little grandchildren might have a fear, not all of us, but some of us, um, have a fear of something, our little grandchildren or children we embrace them and we, we, we embrace their fear and we have very much compassion for whatever it is they might be afraid of, even if it's just the first day of school. And we have to do the same with ourselves. So I have some questions and little cards on a piece of paper that I would like if you could fill out just as we begin. Um. <clears throat> so let's see, how do we get to the next slide? So we have a couple, two to three, uh, two to three ideas. One, um, I would really like for each one of you, if you're, if you're, a, um, if you're open to it, is to write down your intention. When you came here tonight, each one of you came here with an intention. Maybe it was, I want to learn about PTSD. Maybe I have a family member who I'm concerned about. Maybe it's myself. Um, but could you please help me understand your intention for coming here tonight? That would really be of service to me. On those little, there's a little white uh, card. And then we'll pass it to the center, pass it to the center of the stage and s of the seats, and somebody will come get it. The other, um, so intention. And then if you have one or two or maybe three questions that you want answered tonight, I would appreciate if you, such a big group, I would appreciate knowing your thoughts and your feelings as you, as you sit there tonight and it would help me get to know you since I won't be able to really address you too much individually. And um, let me know what your thoughts are, what your concerns and questions are about this topic. So um, finally, I would just like a simple yes or no. One, if you are able to nurture others well, if you feel you nurture others well, and the second question would be, B would be, 
are you able to nurture yourself well? So you can just simple, just say yes to A or no, and then yes or no to B. And then, uh, um, just at the very last question would be, if you have been diagnosed with cancer, or if it was a family member, and that's why you're here, to support your family member. So I'm going to continue the talk, but if you, if you could try to answer those questions um, in the next five minutes or so, then we could pass them to the center, and then someone will come pick them up on the two aisles when you're done, okay? So I'll give you about five minutes to do that. So just some statistics involved with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, in general, and all the different types of post-traumatic stress disorder, um, it affects about 3.5% of people every year. So um, it's, a, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty significant, um, you might say, illness. Um, give you an example, schizophrenia is only about 1% of the population, so it's almost three and a half times the prevalence of schizophrenia in our population. And in, an, in a lifetime, 9%, one out of 10, basically, adults, will have um, a diagnosis, a symptoms that um, give us a diagnosis of PTSD, and that's in the USA. Women are um, more often diagnosed with PTSD. I don't know, I mean, I know that the statistics might say that men more than women drink alcohol, so I don't know if alcohol sometimes is the reason that women are, have more PTSD symptoms because they don't t tend to, uh, they have less prevalence of alcoholism than men. So maybe men would be diagnosed if they weren't drinking uh, as much. But one out of people, one out of five people who are diagnosed with cancer have some symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. So that's 20 percent. That's, that's a big chunk of people have some of the symptoms. <coughs> 21 percent of people diagnosed with cancer do have um, elements of severe anxiety. Um, and anxiety and fear are kind of interrelated. And it doesn't really matter where you are in your diagnosis. You could be four or five years in remission and still have uh, triggers that send you into high levels of anxiety. Um, it's, an, it's, an, it's a diagnosis, post-traumatic stress disorder, that's been around since the ancient Greeks, so it's not new. Relatively, um, and we see it, of course, in World War I, where they called it shell shock or combat neurosis. Um, I was thinking this morning, though, that in this culture that we have now, it's not that old that we were even diagnosed with cancer. In fact, many cultures around the world wouldn't have access necessarily to biopsies and and other PET scans and MRI data. They wouldn't have access to that, so they wouldn't necessarily get a diagnosis that tells them they have cancer. They would just know they're not feeling well and that illness would progress. So PTSD and the diagnosis of cancer is, is probably relatively, relatively new in, 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 in our world history. <clears throat> so, um, by a show of hands, are you almost done with the cards, or uh, are you still eating? Some of you are still eating, and certainly finish your food before you. Okay, so we'll go back, and um, I'm going to review the questions. Very, uh, they're they're not hard questions. So one is, the most important one is your intention for being here. That's the most important. Why are you here? Not on planet Earth, but just why are you here at this moment tonight? 
And it's okay to say, I wanted a free dinner. <laughs> or the chicken is really good here. It's like the best. It's okay to say whatever is true for you today. It's just important to know, um, it's kind of important to know your intention. And, and sometimes our inner child, we'll talk about that a little bit later, sometimes our inner child just, just wants a free meal, you know, not to have to cook. It's kind of nice. So first one is intention. Second one is, is if you have two or three questions that you want answered tonight. Two or three questions you might have come to have answered. So I can take a look at the cards and make sure that I meet your needs of having those answered. Um, and the last, the, the third one would be about, are you able to nurture others well, A, and B, a yes or no, are, are you able to nurture yourself well? And then the last one would be, do you have a diagnosis at some point in time of cancer or was it a family member or friend? And you're here to support them. So can I move on? Yes. Not yet, okay, okay. Well, these are important. Intention is absolutely the most important reason for being here. What's my intention for being here? What's your intention for being here? What if my intention was just to be a channel, a channel of light? I was listening to, um, does anybody listen to Wayne Dwyer? Okay, so he talks about the power of intention, and he talks about sometimes we're just in a role that we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be in this space at this particular time, and that's where we're supposed to be. It's not, it's not about our ego, it's, it's deeper than that. It's a connection to source energy, and that's what we're here to, um, to be. So I like, I like the way he talks about that, intention. Okay, can I go on? Yes. yes, okay, very good. So what's the importance of treatment? If you have, after we talk, um, I have about 10, I have about 20 more minutes to talk, and I'm gonna talk about the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, but I wanna, before I talk about that, I wanna let you know that there's absolutely awesome treatment for symptoms of fear, for symptoms of uh, severe PTSD, um, and, it, and, it, and it will change your life in ways that you cannot even imagine. You cannot even imagine how having the courage to see a therapist or a psychiatrist or both um, will, will take you to a higher level of awareness and understanding of the symptoms which completely shifts your perspective, perspective, Perspective. perspective, yeah, it'll shift your perspective, which will shift you to a level of awareness and understanding of not just this cancer diagnosis, but every single experience, every moment of your life. That's how powerful therapy and treatment is. It's, um, it makes a difference between a a lack of introspection in your life, which is, is just going through motions to an awareness that we're all connected. And there's, it's, it's, it's almost like a, it's almost like a choreographed play. And we become a part, awareness um, helps us with doing our part better. <clears throat> so we talked about this, that, that six, 6.1% can, people can have symptoms of PTSD even after four mi re years of, remi of cancer in remission. So some people even have thought that sometimes people who've had chemotherapy will say, oh, I have chemo brain, and we're not really sure as clinicians how much of that is chemo brain and how much of that is actually PTSD. 
And, and, and perhaps there's a connection also in the neurotransmitter system between chemo brain and PTSD. Perhaps they, they impact the same neurotransmitter system, and that's why some of the symptoms look so familiar. Not right now. Um, please, can you write it down to, so you don't forget, though? And then I'm going to. I already wrote my questions down for the card. Okay, but if you have another question, you can remember. Okay. So uh, triggers of PTSD. Um, so anything stressful, terrifying, terrifying experience that we have to go through. So we. We get information or we see something, it can include accidents, crimes, serious illnesses, addiction, death of a loved one. When I, when I put addiction, what came to my mind, I don't know, have any of you read this book called A Beautiful Boy or seen the movie? Yeah. So addiction is like PTSD that keeps, keeps occurring. Um, and for some of us, a serious illness is like that. We might have a relapse, so it keeps occurring and it just has these um, triggers. So natural disasters, of course, hurricane, earthquake, quake, uh, flood, uh, physical or sexual abuse, and we hear a lot of what's going on with the Me Too, and so some of, some of what I'm gonna talk about um, addresses why it takes so long for us to um, deal with trauma, that it can, that can be trauma for, at age 14 and not deal with it till age 39 or 45. Uh, wars, guns, gun violence, terrorism, gangs, we're seeing a lot of that and we're gonna probably end up seeing a lot of PTSD related to the current problems in our uh, culture. So what's the difference between PTSD and a kind of a normal reaction to a, a, a life-threatening illness or a life-threatening situation or a life-threatening experience? Normally, we're going to have upsetting memories. That's normal. We're going to think about it. Somebody told us something. We were fine in the morning. We were told something in the afternoon. And that changed everything for us. Sometimes that can happen. We were fine driving to work. We saw an accident and somebody was killed. All of a sudden, our world has changed completely. We're going to feel on edge because it makes us less, feeling less secure about what what's going to happen next, what's going to happen next, what's going to happen next. And the trouble sleeping is normal. Normal activities like work and school and time with family or friends, of course, is, can be very difficult after experiencing a terrifying or life-threatening experience. And these can all be normal. Um, they can even last for weeks to months, and the main uh, the main approach to them probably will be with, with compassion. Have compassion for yourself. Have compassion for your family member who's going through this. But if the symptoms continue and they start to really impact your ability to function, then we call that PTSD. If they last longer than a month. So you'll see startle reaction, you overreact to things. Or anticipatory anxiety. In other words, you have something coming up in a week. You have the biopsy results. You have the MRI scan. You have another test. You have the chemotherapy coming up. So all those anticipatory anxiety will impact your moment-to-moment -moment life. Hypervigilance, insomnia, and these are all symptoms of PTSD. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. So these are other symptoms, uh, another way of saying some of the symptoms of PTSD. They overlap, disturbing thoughts, imaging, the, the remembering perhaps the, maybe the experience was very abrupt. It's possible that our experience with our health provider could be abrupt or maybe we felt that we felt angry, we might be angry about it. We have um, physical or mental um, distress to trauma-related cues. <clears throat> so 
when we're driving, if we have it related to an accident, when we come to that place where the accident was, we might uh, revisual visualize what we saw again. But it alter it alters the way we think and the way we feel, and that's what you have to be aware of, that we, we experience perhaps a diagnosis, a life-threatening, potentially life-threatening diagnosis, and all of a sudden, everything we think and feel is completely altered. So we were going to buy some new furniture for the house. That changes completely, completely changes. What we were going to do, we were going to plan a vacation in Hawaii, that completely changes. So the alteration in how we're thinking and how we're feeling is huge. Um, we have this increase in our feeling of, of flight or fight. So we, we react to things very differently. We might even be extremely irritable with people. They might not understand why we're reacting in the way that the, to them seems very different than our normal state. Um, and like I said, symptoms should last greater than a month. These, these symptoms are all normal. And some of most people will get through this. But there's quite a few people that would benefit almost, I think, well, in case I'm very biased. I think everybody will benefit from introspection, which some people call therapy. Um, increased risk for suicide or self-harm. So that's the, the thinking that people have too. So again, some of these symptoms, um, mainly the most important part is that there, the symptoms persist to such a su sufficient degree to cause dysfunction in life. And they're greater than one month. So why, what, what factors are involved with people, maybe different people, some people see a, um, have a gun put to their head and they don't react, or some people get a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis or, or cancer or another um, serious medical problem and they seem to be able to um, embrace it and, and move on. Um, some of these might be, you know, might be inherited personality, temperament, or also we have to talk about environmental factors in handling stress. Sometimes children are exposed to a lot of stress in childhood and then when they ex get exposed later on it, it repeats. Sometimes there's biochemical biochemi factors in the brain. And we'll talk a little bit about that, but it's absolutely um, enlightening what can happen when we address the neurotransmitter systems. And we'll talk about that, how the, the benefit of sometimes using SSRI antidepressants um, are, are pretty magical in the sense that um, I can, you can see differences just in two and four weeks, how people, the level of fear goes down and the level of empowerment goes up. Um, emotional maturity is difficult to measure, but um, perhaps um, emotional maturity um, becomes as an intention. If you have an intention to gradually um, mature and use all your available coping skills in life, I, I know that now um, some people, for example, who tend to, to go to alcohol or, or other substances to cope with stress, what would happen in their year of sobriety is they would mature sometimes 15 years. You ask them, how old do you feel? And they're 30 and they feel 15 and they have a year of sobriety and now they feel 30. Now they feel 30 because they've gone through a lot of uh, life experiences without using alcohol to numb their, uh, their awareness and to, um, and, and it doesn't flavor their, their, re their reaction. They respond and they, and so emotional maturity is, uh, is something that that happens, I think, as we learn to embrace everything that comes to us with love and with gratitude. And that um, is, is a lofty goal. Uh, substance use prior to the event and as a coping tool, I think that that 
that actually, um, from my experience, substance use actually um, kind of paralyzes us to some degree and also um, retards us into the emotional growth experience because um, you can, you, you know, the joke is you can hear somebody who's, who's drinking a beer or two and they're talking about their divorce and you think, wow, you know, must have just happened like six months ago or a year ago. And actually they're drinking and, and then you ask them, well, when did you get that divorce? Well, it was 15 years ago. It's like, wow. So sometimes you see that people have trouble processing painful experiences when they use too much of the substances. And cannabis is big right now, it's a hot item. And uh, alcohol is, is so is, is also. But be aware that if you're having pro difficulty processing painful experiences, try to get away from those substances because the soul and the mind have, have unlimited potential to solve anything that we experience. And, and spiritually, when you, when you don't depend on that, you have to depend on something else. You have to depend on something else. And so there's also the joke about, about there's no soldier. I think I have it here. <laughs> there's, no soldier. there's no soldier in a, um, in a, in a trench, or whatever you call it, where they, uh, that foxhole that doesn't have a spiritual connection. You know, so when we're in the foxhole and there's no alcohol or drugs, we're, we're definitely going to be looking for some kind of higher energy, higher source of, uh, of coping. So, so I, I'm talking a little bit about avoiding, avoiding things. Um, probably some of you, when, if you were diagnosed with cancer or if your friend or loved one was diagnosed with cancer, sometimes we tend to try to avoid. We try to push it out of memory. We try to um, close that door, close that um, closet, and not, and not deal with it. I, I, I kind of think of, um, who was it? Gone with the wind. <laughs> you know, that personality where she said, I'll deal with it tomorrow. So, when? Very good, very good. That wasn't, I, I, I could give you points or maybe a bonus for that, but yeah. But that, that tendency to not want to talk about things. So that's, that, that tends to um, s uh, slow the process of, of um, finding the reason and purpose for what's happening, what we're having to go through. So again, anniversary reactions, sometimes a year or two years. Um, Something can trigger that where we remembered, oh yeah, it was, was December, it was right before Christmas when I was diagnosed and now a year's coming up and it just triggers all the feelings. So one good thing to do during those um, upcoming anniversaries for you, any kind of trauma, um, is to be proactive and, and pick something that is comforting to you to be doing during and, and prior to the anniversary. So if you maybe enjoy the mountains, pick, pick an, a weekend where you can just go to the mountains and, and change those memories into positive ones. Um, so what is mental health? Some people say that mental health is, is to stand unshaken beneath the crash of break, breaking worlds and that's what it might feel like when you get a diagnosis, any diagnosis of a, a serious medical problem, but specifically in this case we're talking about cancer. So you feel that the whole world is breaking over you, not just you, but also your family members. Maybe you had planned to travel this year, but instead you're, you, you have to focus on health-related um, activity. So you want to embrace, you want to embrace the diagnosis. Are any of you familiar with embracing, um, embracing the worst things that happen to you in life? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so you want to embrace the diagnosis and ideally, which is really hard in the moment, whether it's you're going through a divorce or whether you're, um, you know, some other serious problem, your child is sick or something like that, 
Um, ideally, and I don't think I should even say it because it's so ideal, but great gratitude. Gratitude is, is, is helpful. Gratitude is very helpful. Gratitude and surrender are, um, are keys to getting through the process. Um, if I might, yeah, I'm not gonna say with joy, but they, it, 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 it opens up, it opens up a consciousness that we're not aware of when we embrace with compassion and with gratitude and with surrender. So treatment, try, try uh, psychotropic medications. I mentioned them briefly. The SSRIs are usually the ones we use. And why do we use them? Because the serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors, basically what they do, what we can see with PET scan data, is that the serotonin levels sometimes are very low in crisis situations. So even when you're caring for someone, your serotonin levels can get very depleted. When you're sick yourself and you constantly have to keep going back to the doctors and they're doing tests and you're going through chemo and you're going through this and you're going, it, it burns up a lot of the neurotransmitters that we use to deal with um, everyday stress in life. So if we could measure everybody as easily as we measure thyroid with um, just a blood test, we might measure everybody in this room as having their neurotransmitter system depleted. Now, if that was the case, there would be a lot of resistance um, just because of theoretically to go and get uh, treatment. So we're out of time. So the SSRIs are extremely helpful. We use group um, supportive therapy, individual therapy, and they're gonna talk about EMDR. Meditation and spiritual practice can be helpful, but when you do have PTSD, it's very difficult to get into a meditative state for some. With, um, and then we're gonna talk about alternate approaches. But the psychotropic medication, as I mentioned, is mostly the SSRIs. They help both also with pain because in the spine, serotonin is a, is a natural pain inhibitor. So those, when those um, with chronic pain, um, that can, the serotonin in the spine can get uh, de decreased. We also use the atypical. <laughs> I have so many slides, so. Um, so a lot of therapeutic options. But I wanna bring up the concept before I leave about PTSD growth. And if you Google it, you'll find it in Wikipedia. And it's an ancient, it's kind of an ancient idea. Um, it comes from many different um, spiritual backgrounds. But it's basically the understanding that the meaning of human suffering and the, the meaning, there's meaning behind suffering. And the meaning, only we can find it individually. We have to find it individually. And actually, there can be a gift. And I'm just going to leave you with this. When, when I was going through um, divorce, which is probably one of the most painful experiences some of us can experience in a life, um, when you embrace it, what the gift that I got was discernment. I didn't have that before. I couldn't buy it in Nordstrom's, I've looked. <laughs> so when you're embracing things, what you might get is you might get the idea of what is unconditional love. So you find that you have a partner who is giving you unconditional love. You're embracing this diagnosis and you find, my God, my partner is there for me. That's amazing. And you realize how much you're grateful for the unconditional love that your partner has been willing to give you th through this process. So, you, you know, when you embrace something, you embrace, embrace the illness, you also can maybe embrace the fact that many years of my life I've just been running around in the material world buying stuff. Maybe I don't need to do that in the next 20 years. Maybe I need to focus on just being grateful for my family and the love that we have. So when you embrace things, you get a gift. And each one will get a different gift. Um, but that's the, 
that's the kind of the thoughts behind the uh, PTSD growth. And they basically say there's 90% of people are truly tell you that there has been growth, that they have, they have uh, grown and learned something um, that they didn't know before. They didn't know before they had this trauma in their life. I, I don't know if any of you feel like that. So now's the time for questions. But um, Richard Tedeschi actually did a study on PTSD growth, and he said that 90% of people, survivors of uh, PTSD, um, you know, maybe it takes a year or two or five years later, but they do, um, they do say that they've learned something that they didn't know before the trauma. So I hope, and I hope and pray that all of you um, are, are getting to that place where you have the introspection and the insight to somehow be grateful for the gift. Maybe not for the experience you have to go through to get the gift. That's usually very painful. But the gift itself is sometimes worth that journey. And I'll just leave it at that. Any questions right now? If you have a question, if you can raise your hand, we have some people in the audience who will come to you. Okay, we've got a question here. Yes, uh, thank you for the talk. So uh, my question is that what, um, what kind of doctor we can get started with? Like if we know somebody who would tell us, yes, you have PTSD or you have other symptoms, wh which doctor? would be, I mean, generalist or oncologist or a therapist? <laughs> I would start with a psychiatrist. As much as people think only crazy people go to psychiatry and you think, I'm not crazy, I don't need to see a psychiatrist. Psychiatry, what we, what we help with is we help um, with process. You can also start with a therapist if a psychiatrist, the idea of seeing a psychiatrist is kind of scary. Um, so, so some people are, are fear, uh, fear. Okay, so what prevents people from coming to us? Is it that, that the United States has a culture that's extremely mentally healthy? No, that's not true. <laughs> okay, so if the United States does not have a culture that's extremely mentally healthy, what prevents people from seeing somebody who's an expert at mental health? Stigma. Stigma. So I think we're out of the Middle Ages, guys. There's no inquisition. Nobody's going to say, oh my god, have you seen a psychiatrist? Are you crazy? So, so you're going to have to be brave souls. And only the brave souls actually get into my office. So I know that anybody coming to see me is extremely brave. And that's what it takes. That's what it takes to get peace of mind. That's what we sell. That's what mental health sells. We sell peace of mind. But most people don't either don't value it or don't value it enough to jump the hurdle of fear. And so um, stigma is, is, is fear-based. It's a fear-based reason not to see us. So if you, if you see a therapist, that's a great start. We have some great therapists who are gonna talk right now as soon as I get off this platform. And, or a psychiatrist. And we're really, really, really good at helping you find peace of mind. That's what we do. That's what we get paid for. If I was a mechanic, you'd definitely come to me. Fix your car. Your car would be running so smoothly. It'd be like, whoosh. I'm so glad I saw that mechanic. So the mind is a barrier to the peace of the soul. Just saying that. OK, any other questions? Over here. Uh-huh. Oh, you've got the mic. Hi, Dr. Ellers. Thank you for that talk. Very informative. What I was wondering is all these things that we see up here, can we get a copy of those? Of the, of the of slides? All things that you put up here. I, 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 I I'm not ones. good at that, but maybe uh, the, the... If you send them to me, I'll post them. If I send them to you. Mm -hmm. I have to figure out how to do that. I don't have a computer. <laughs> we'll do that. We'll but do that. Mitchell, that oh, very you don't have a computer, so you want to print it. No, I'm still in the 19th century. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> That's okay. We're all, we're, we're, some of us are more techie and others are, doesn't mean you're, 
We have a question over here. Okay, go ahead. So yes, I will get you a copy if I can. You're welcome to it. Okay, so the question is, is the, re the question is, is how do we know we don't? There is no, there's no way that we know Dr. Amen in Orange County does like $6,000 PET scan stuff and so he's, he has more clear data. We only go by symptoms, so we're kind of old fashioned. In the old days, probably they would treat diabetes without really doing a blood test, you know? We would just know because you'd have all these symptoms of diabetes, right? And so we try some insulin and, and somehow you, your symptoms would get better. So with, with um, chemical imbalances in the brain, we do have data in PET scan data and research that tells us what the person looked like PET scan wise before the medication and what they looked like after. And we can see that the brain lights up all over the place because the neurotransmitter system was depleted and now it's lighting up and fixed. So sometimes we suggest to patients, we say, okay, so look at the pros and the cons. You can always keep what you have. You can always not take medicine. If you come to my office, you can choose to stay exactly the way you are biochemically. Or you could try it for a month and see a difference. And most people, after two weeks, see a huge difference. And what they notice, it's a very subtle difference in the sense that they're not so fearful. Or they're able to go out to dinner with their friends after about a month, where they weren't before. So they see the difference in their energy and moving out and having different thoughts that aren't so debilitating. Fear can paralyze you. It can absolutely paralyze you. And depression, we call it fear, depression, those, those are symptoms of low energy. And when we fix a neurotransmitter system, but I'm 10 minutes over, I think, or five. We have one more question. Five She's gonna hold her hand for uh -huh. a while. Go ahead. Uh -huh. um, I'd like, hopefully there's a simple answer to this difficult question. Um, I've been, a lot of us have been dealing with just everyday life and the up and down stresses with that. And then after our cancer diagnosis, then we have this new one, a whole nother world of them that keeps you busy. So in a nutshell, other than coming to see you professionally, is there like a, a map of what we do, did you already write a book, as to what we can do to deal with the anxiety and stresses that we had coming prior to our diagnosis? Well, I would highly recommend that you get, first of all, just even start with a therapist. I, I, you know, when we have a toothache, it doesn't take us too long to get find a dentist, guys, okay? But when it comes to stress, we're kind of reluctant, and sometimes our insurance doesn't really pay that well, too. I mean, we, I don't want you to have to spend a lot of money, I really don't, um, to get the help you need. But um, in a nutshell, um, it's, it's a bit more complicated than that because we carry baggage. Most of us will be aware of the baggage we're carrying since age five, six, seven, eight. We have not let that, any of that baggage go. So we're carrying all this baggage and then we get another giant bag that says cancer diagnosis, you know? So now we're carrying all this stuff and it's really overwhelming where to begin. So really where we begin is by embracing and, and, and being grateful. There's a whole thing I wanted to give you on Dr. Um, Emoto Matsura information, but he talks about just the thought of being grateful and grateful and um, I think it's love and, and gratitude change vibration, even water. I mean, it's complicated. I can't really give you one thing, but if you were my patient, what I would start with is probably trying to have you connect to your source. Whatever perception, if it's Christ or God or you know, nature, I would encourage you to start that connection, getting that connection, because we're speeding up so fast, we do things so fast here. There's a million things on our plate and we need to slow it down. We need to slow it down and just start with that connection and surrender and say, guide me. And let the tears come if that's necessary. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Ellers. Can we give her another hand? Okay, and our next guest, our next guest, next speaker is Crystal Quinto. And um, let's, uh, Crystal is a psychosocial coordinator of oncology services at Torrance Memorial's Hunt Cancer Institute. She received her bachelor's degree in sociology from the University of California in Berkeley and a master's degree in social work from Loma Linda University. Crystal is also certified in oncology social work and a member of the National Association of Social Workers. Crystal began her career in healthcare social worker social work at Cedar sinai Medical Center, where she helped develop new programs promoting quality patient care and collaborative practice. She is now expanding the social, psychosocial services at the Hunt Cancer Institute, which includes Coping with Cancer, a series that will begin in the late fall. Great news. Crystal is also in the process of adding a specialization in positive psychology, which focuses on building resiliency as a means of treating difficult emotions. Crystal may be a social worker by day, but she is a big sci-fi geek at night. She is married with three t toddlers, <laughs> yeah, a four-year-old four and two-year-old twins. She's busy, all boys. <laughs> Um, she goes to work for self-care. <laughs> Thank you, Crystal. Yeah. It's true. I go to work for self-care. <laughs> Toddlers are scary. Sometimes they're okay. They give you a head massage with their feet. Yeah. Good evening. Can you all hear me? Okay? Good. My mom is somewhere in the audience and she needs to hear everything. She invited herself before I even told her what the topic was about. But it's okay, she's a 13-year cancer survivor. And after all those years, she's developed the skill she came to be very good at, called selective attention. So whenever I ask her, Mom, how was your doctor's appointment? I don't know. <laughs> Mom, when's your next mammogram? I don't know. Mom, what was the result of your genetic testing? I don't know. They never called, so it must be a good thing. That's probably because you don't answer your phone, Mom. <laughs> yeah. If you can help me out here, please raise your hand if you dread going to cancer appointments. Yeah. Raise your hand if your blood pressure goes up when you hear the word cancer. I apologize in advance for the next two hours. <laughs> Just an hour. Raise your hand if you can't stand another MRI, CT scan, mammogram, ultrasound, or another thing that would cost another copay. <laughs> Everybody's hand should be up. And lastly, please raise your hand if a doctor or a nurse have recommended that you see a therapist or be on anti-medication, anti-depressant or anti-anxiety medication. It's okay, everything stays here. Yes. Thank you for participating. You just showed my mom and everybody in this room that you are not alone. This is a form of self-care, to be surrounded by people who understand you. For the sake of this presentation, I'm going to define self-care as a conscious effort of acknowledging, addressing, and maintaining your needs. So there's three parts into this. Admitting that you need self-care, doing something about it, and making it last. Self-care is also our personal way of optimizing your health, whether that's physical health, mental health, emotional health, social health, and spiritual health. Okay. 
Many of my patients who are or have become caregivers to their family or loved one um, share feelings of guilt when they want to take a break or do something for themselves. We need to shift this thought because self-care is a basic human responsibility. Self-care is not selfish. Self-care is a basic necessity. Up to 80% of doctor's visits are stress-related. Self-care has become a prescription for wellness when really it should have been well integrated into your life. So whether you're a cancer patient trying to cope with your illness, a family member who's worried about your loved one, a caregiver who's desperately holding it together, even a cancer provider who's taking care of a patient, whoever, whoever you are, wherever you are in life, you need to integrate self-care in your daily living. There is a book by Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, an expert in trauma called The Body Keeps the Score. In the book, he acknowledged that the memory of trauma cannot be changed. And our body's response to that memory is what we are fighting with in the present. Cancer-related trauma, like any other trauma, has robbed you of the feeling that you are in charge of yourself. Every time a traumatic memory comes up, getting diagnosed, going through treatment, dealing with the side effects, coping with loss, sometimes even fears of recurrence or the future, the body responds as if it is still happening in the present time. A problem he identifies when a person has trauma is the loss of control, as if we're being hijacked by our own body and our fire alarm system has broken. The goal then is to reclaim self-leadership. And achieving self-leadership is reestablishing ownership and control of your body so that you can feel free to know and feel anything that comes your way without being consumed by them. There's nothing wrong with feeling all the emotions that you feel, the fears, the anxieties, even the simple joys. I know coping with emotions vary by culture or personal values, but what I also tell my patients is that we have been given a rainbow of emotions and they all need to be felt, okay? When you acknowledge your emotions, you give them little control to overpower you. When you deny them and ignore them, they will more likely consume you. Dr. Van Der Kolk also suggested that an important step into reclaiming self-leadership is revisiting your trauma, but only when you feel safe. For now, you can adopt self-care strategies that are not necessarily meant to directly cure PTSD, but to manage the symptoms of cancer-related trauma. This is in hope that by adopting these strate strategies, you can build confidence to eventually confront your fears, your trauma. There are many self-care strategies out there, but we're only gonna talk about some. The first being is mindfulness, which is synonymous to self-awareness. Mindfulness meditation is bringing your full mind and attention to an object or an experience. Now, why is that important in self-care? When you're dealing with trauma, you are on a fight or flight mode because there is a threat of cancer. You fight by going to your treatment appointments, following doctor's orders, doing what you can to stay healthy, and surrounding yourself with support. On the other hand, sometimes you may go in a flight mode. When you try to avoid thinking about cancer, you try to suppress negative emotions such as fear, anger, worries about the future, and sometimes for some people they skip treatment. Mindfulness allows you to be present with whatever you are feeling at the moment. It is not so much trying to clear your mind, but it encourages you to listen to yourself and find compassion in acknowledging and validating your feelings. And by acknowledging your emotions, you can then direct them accordingly and more constructively to feel more at peace. 
There is another book called When Things Fall Apart by Pema Chodron. I don't know if I said that right. Who points out that who points out the term refraining, which is the practice of not immediately filling up space just because there's a gap. In today's culture, it's pretty hard to be okay with idleness. There's always distraction or there's always something to do. We crave for entertainment and we feel lonely with nothing or things we don't like. This is a big challenge when you're trying to achieve mindfulness. Chodron kept going, explaining that refraining is the method for getting to know the nature of this restlessness and fear. If we immediately entertain ourselves by talking, by acting, by thinking, if there's never any pause, we will never be able to relax. We will always be speeding through our lives. And the next thing you know, you come out of, ne you come out of cancer not even recognizing why, how, and what you become, what you have become. To easily remember the struggles of coping with cancer, but not recognizing the strength that you have developed along the way that helped you got through it. Mindfulness allows you to investigate the emotional gaps. Mindfulness allows you to see the bigger picture, the other side of the story, so, do, so that you do not become overtaken by undesirable emotions. Breathing techniques help deal with hyperarousal and tension. Sometimes when we remember a traumatic or a very stressful moment, memory, we experience rapid heartbeat, uneven breathing, stomach pains, sweating tension. Breathing techniques can help manage these symptoms and can be done anywhere. The first technique is breath awareness by focusing on each step, putting a special effort and attention to controlling your breath, you can slowly normalize your heartbeat and calm your body down. You can also go to the destressmonday.org and follow this really cool animation right there. Is it working? Yes. It's very therapeutic just watching it. Self-care. Okay. There's also a breathing technique called 478 breathing. You inhale for four seconds, hold for seven seconds, and exhale for eight seconds. So I'm going to let you guys try um, it out for three cycles. You can follow the animation right there. How was that? Anybody had a hard time holding it? Yeah. Yeah, me too. I almost, I'm almost passed out. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't recommend for you to, to try it if you, if, to try it to hold, to try holding it for seven seconds if you can't. Just, just for as long as you can within that seven seconds. What's important is that, <clears throat> is your exhale. Um, you have to extend your exhale for as long as you can. As Dr. Van Der Kolk states that when we inhale, we stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, which results in an increase in heart rate. Exhalations stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, which decreases how fast the heart beats. Therefore, extend your exhale for as long as you can. This will be responsible in slowing down your heart beat. Progressive muscle relaxation is tensing your muscle as you breathe in and releasing, releasing it as you breathe out. You can walk your body through this from your head to toe. Okay. Visualization, immersing in relaxing mental experience. I want you to look at this video and try to visualize yourself there. You want to try to involve your senses so that you can immerse yourself in the experience. It's supposed to move, I don't know, I guess. <laughs> Did it move? Okay, anyway. Tell yourself what you see. 
the color of the sky, the pattern of the clouds, the way the leaves gently sway as the wind blows. What do you hear? The crashing of the waves. Maybe some birds flying around you. The rustling of the leaves in the tree. What do you smell? The heat from the sun, the gentle breeze on your face, the cold. Wait, what is? I, I'm totally lost. I don't know what I said. Smell or feel? I don't want you to smell what you feel. Um, what do you feel? The cold water touching your toes. This can be very relaxing activity to guide your mind into a vision of comfort. Helps you sleep as well. Ah, it didn't work too. That would have been a cool video. Um, did she move? Oh. Oh no. Okay. Well, maybe not. Physical activity helps gain control over your body. Walking, fitness programs, swimming, hiking, dancing, rhythmic activities are some examples um, for exercise or physical activity. Rhythmic activities are a combination of physical movements with sound, beats, or music. It's mostly used as a means of self-expression and can vary by culture. Multiple studies actually have been um, done on the effects of yoga, tai chi, zumba, and other rhythmic activities in stress management. Uh, and some of the findings include improved confidence in movement, flexibility and balance, improved self-esteem, improved pain and better memory, more energy and better overall quality of life. The, vi the video would have been really cool. I mean, it's very therapeutic just to watch her. Yeah. Anyways, healthy diet. Healthy diet is an important part of self-care. However, I'm not going to go um, too much about this because cancer and nutrition, a, a cancer and nutrition series class just started at Torrance Memorial, which is held every third Wednesday of the month from 5 to 6. Um, the cancer support community also down in Redondo Beach have cooking demonstrations and talks on cancer and nutrition. Uh, we all have the flyers over there. One takeaway, though, is that we need to treat food as medicine. We need to start doing that because they do have an impact in our mood, the way we feel, our energy level, and the way we think. Also, there are a lot of food trends going on. Ketogenic diet, I don't know what that is. Don't ask me. Paleo diet, whatever it is, you need, your needs are very specific. And if you want to know what the best dietary regimen is for you, please consult a dietitian or talk to your doctor. Okay, sleep, oh, whoa. Healthy diet. Hi, Mr. Hope. Creative expressions. All right, participating in therapeutic art. One of the things I do when my kids go crazy is I give them a paper and crayons. And all of a sudden, my house goes silent. I think that one of the saddest things about growing up is losing that part of ourselves, the part when we play, the part when we imagine, where we, the part we ima when we imagine, and the part when we create. Perhaps you can join a coloring or a writing group at the Cancer Support Community or join a book club at your local library, enroll in an art class or sing, watch a concert. If there's no group, perhaps you can start one. Maybe, <clears throat> creative expressions help you regulate your emotions in a creative way. Cal State Dominguez Hills actually has a program for retired and semi-retired individuals that offer activities for intellectual and social stimulation. This is also self-care because it promotes personal growth and lifelong learning. Sleep, improving sleep. <coughs> sleep improving sleep quality. Up to 60% of cancer survivors suffer from sleep disturbance. Higher if you are diagnosed with head and neck cancer. Higher if you are newly diagnosed or recently treated. Higher if you have an existing psychiatric illness or other health conditions, higher if you have other so psychosocial stressors in your life, and definitely higher 
if you are a caregiver. Insomnia is a sleep disorder characterized by difficulties falling and staying asleep. Sleep aids are over-the-counter medications and over-counter medications are meant for temporary relief, not for long-term. Let me repeat that for my mom. <laughs> sleep aids or over-the-counter medications such as melatonin, Zequel, NyQuil, Benadryl, Valerian are meant for temporary relief, not meant to be used for long term. Chronic insomnia should be treated with lifestyle change changes with the oversight of your medical doctor and a psychotherapist. There's okay. There are different techniques for treating insomnia or sleep disturbance. You can do the first two on your own while the rest you do in psychotherapy. Sleep hygiene is how you practice healthy sleeping habits. It requires cognitive, behavioral, and environmental changes. Basically changing the way you think about sleep, changing the way you sleep, and changing the, environ the way your environment supports sleep. There are different sleep hygiene rules, but I'm only going to talk about some. Keep a regular schedule wake up and go to sleep at the same time every day because this will stabilize your circadian rhythm or your biological clock. Exercise or do a physical activity in the late afternoon or early evening because it, is, it can shorten your sleep onset, which means you can fall asleep faster and also deepen your sleep. Avoid caffeine, nicotine, and alcohol because they all negatively impact your sleep. Some people probably hate me after I said caffeine. Caffeine and nicotine are stimulants, so they will keep you awake. Alcohol is a sedative, so it will knock your brain out rather than put you in natural sleep. It was based on this very good book, Why We Sleep. I forgot, Matthew Walker, I believe, is the author. Very good um, book. He also said that Alcohol is a, po is a very potent chemical that blocks our REM sleep, rapid eye movement. Enhance sleep environment by setting your thermostat in a comfortable temperature, investing in a good pillow or a mattress, avoiding watching TV in the bedroom. Sometimes you watch TV or read to help you fall asleep. That's okay as long as you sleep for the rest of the night or wake up at regular times, which means you probably don't have insomnia, so don't worry about it. Limit or avoid napping if you can. However, you might feel more fatigued um, or weak while in treatment, so I suggest that you listen to your body um, and do whatever is safe. Space, creating a safe environment. This is very important in self-care. You want to be able to go inside that door feeling safe. Not threatened, not more stressed out. How do we do that? I'm not gonna go Marie Kondo on you <laughs> because I need work myself. But what I can tell you is that watching one episode of her show on Netflix made my husband clean the garage. I only had to tell him five years to do that. Marie Kondo did it in 30 minutes. Anyway, try to declutter. Eliminate things that do not add value to your life. Ask yourself, does this give me stress or happiness? Do I need, do I need it or do I want it? Actually, just ask yourself if you need it because you're always going to want it, um, whatever it is. So you spend most of your time at home, so design a home where you actually want to stay in. If you don't have much space, you can dedicate a safe corner where you can go to and meditate. And please also fall proof your home. Um, there are many fall prevention guides on the internet. If not, you can, um, you know, I can send you some if you want. And speaking of internet, make sure that you use reliable resources 
for cancer research and information. You want to be able to use the internet to your advantage and not your disadvantage. Join online support groups that are positive, not discouraging. And remember that other, spe other people's life is not a standard to yours. I suggest asking your care team where online you should be researching about the type of cancer and the treatment that you have. Um, national, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network or nccn.org is a website that clinicians use. They post clinical guidelines to help diagnose, treat, and manage your cancer. So there would be a, that would be a reliable website, nccn.org. Spending at least 20 minutes in nature can make your day better or can make you feel better. Findings in a study shared 64% in the participants' self-reported well-being and a decrease in stress hormone. So go ahead, you can take a walk. People watch. You can do that. Relationships. Generally speaking, cancer survivors who have good social support have better outcomes and a more positive outlook in their cancer experience than those who are limited in this area. Which is why support groups, social clubs, religious communities, and networking groups are available to enhance social engagement and support. So how do we interpret this in the context of self-care? Cancer is a test to our character and our relationship. We find that people we expect to be there are not, and those who we don't expect to be there are. We can take this as an opportunity to make social trimming so that you can maintain a solid support system. Strengthening connections for some people may mean building new relationships by joining a support group or meeting a cancer, another cancer survivor. Strengthening can also mean reinforcing existing relationships such as marriages or friendships or limiting encounters with those we don't find very uplifting. Again, social trimming. You can cut people off. We can just blame it on cancer. All right. I want to focus a little bit here about the family system, particularly for married couples. We know that cancer is, is personal, but it is also family disease. It affects everyone in the family system because the structure and the roles are suddenly disturbed reversed or threatened. Some assume multiple roles and some lose roles. Some gain roles and some are forced to take on roles. Husbands are now cooking and cleaning the house. Wives are now having to fix something in the house or trying to figure out how the car works. Children are taking care of their parents and their parents are taking care of their adult children. Next thing you know, someone is isolating themselves. They're not talking much. They're more angry or irritable. A lot of blaming is happening or expectations are not being met. These are some things to remember when dealing with people. Be clear about what you want. Never assume that other people know what you're thinking or what you feel. My husband always tells me he cannot read my mind, so verbalize what you want, okay? Set realistic expectations and try not to just expect one person to do it. Allow people to help, especially if they offer. And if you don't have anything specific for them to help you with, then perhaps you can suggest having them send you a positive note, sending you a card, making a call, just some encouragement, nothing too imposing. Be patient and flexible. The healthcare system is not perfect, and the people are definitely not perfect. Understand that everyone has their own way of coping, and they will most likely be different from yours, and that's okay. Let them cope, as long as it is safe. Express gratitude 
Be sensitive about people's personal values. Don't force them to do something they are not comfortable. I had a patient who did not want to go out of her house because she was afraid that people she know, people, someone she knows um, might see her and they would make a comment about how she changed. Dealing with cancer is tough, but dealing with people talking about your cancer is tougher. Try to prepare some responses to common questions or statements. Remember, it is up to you who you want to tell, and it is up to you who you want to be involved. You can keep an open, open door policy if you want to talk about it. You can keep the door closed by telling them you don't want to talk about it, or maybe you can talk about it later. You can also give them a heads up that a family member or a friend or a manager can uh, send for you. Finances. I've had a couple of patients who was lost to follow up because they were afraid of the medical bills piling up. It is difficult to live on a fixed income, even more so difficult when you live on a fixed income dealing with cancer. The cost of cancer is high and it can be very stressful to the patients and their family. It can also be very traumatic to be on a medical debt or a debt in general. We don't want you to deny yourself the treatment that you need um, you need, despite of the cost, is that right? Care that you need because of the cost. Your life is so much more important, but this fear associated with financial toxicity is real. Financial toxicity is a term introduced by two oncologists, which recognize that cancer-related financial stress, stress could be just as toxic as the effects of chemotherapy or other cancer treatments. It's really terrible. So how do we take care of our finances? I'm only going to highlight some, since finances can be a personal thing. Be resourceful. Ask yourself how you can save money. Contact your utility agencies and ask for discounts that you are entitled for, such as senior or disabled um, discounts, especially if you're using electricity for medical equipment that you need, go to a local food bank, check if you qualify for Medi-Cal so it helps you with your co-pays. Perhaps consider a no interest loan if you really have to. See if you qualify for a premium assistance or talk to a social worker to discuss other options. Appeal any medical bills that does not make sense. I've had a patient once who called her insurance after she received a bill for something she thought was covered and she found out they were missing a medical record. The doctor's office did not send it, so she, after she coordinated that, they cleared her balance. Don't be afraid to call about your bill if it does not make sense, okay? So I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna highlight what needs to be highlighted. Recurrence, dealing with the unknown, and it's normal to have worries about this, but if it starts to affect your quality of life, then it is best to seek help, okay? Advanced care planning is also a form of self-care. It protects your family from avoidable physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual agony of trying to figure out what should be at a critical time. We have advanced directive workshops here at Torrance Memorial. Um, you can also meet someone at the Care Coordination Center if you want to fill out one. I also want to acknowledge secondary trauma, which is very important, which is also um, another lecture. Anybody have children, young children here or grandchildren? There is a flyer on the table that will help give you tips on how to deal with children. But being honest never um, fail, ne will never fail you. Okay, so just be honest with them. Self-image, okay, allow yourself time to grieve, allow yourself time to recover. Rebuild your confidence and reset expectations on what makes you comfortable about yourself, not expectations of going back to the way you were just because this is what others are expecting of you. Remember, you are doing this for yourself, not for others, okay? Reward yourself, be kind to yourself, and embrace yourself with positive support that will help you go along the way. Again, there are many other self-care strategies out there, but here are some reminders 
um, to think about. It takes time to find the right self-care practice. It does require some effort and experimentation to find the right activity. You can explore existing ones or create your own. You can also continue doing what you're doing if it works. You can mix and match when you try and when trying new things, be open-minded. What you did in the past may no longer be effective, but you're always in a position to discover new solutions, okay? You are in the path of reclaiming self-leadership in order to recover from cancer-related trauma. So I hope that my mom and everyone here learned a thing or two and can adopt a strategy in the near future. And remember, self-care is not just an activity. It is a lifestyle that you build so that you can have a life you do not want to escape from. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Crystal. Is Anne, Corinne, right? Okay, Nelson. Um, Anne has been a physical therapist for 40 years, had been a physical therapist for 40 years, working in outpatient orthopedics and home health. Ten years ago, she decided to go back to school and pursue a master's in marriage and family therapy. In 2010, she began an internship at the cancer support community and has been there ever since. Currently, Ann Corinne facilitates family partner groups and cancer patient groups. In addition, she has part-time counseling practice in Redondo Beach, working with individuals, couples, and families. Anne is a member of EMDRIA, the International Association of EMDR Practitioners and Researchers. EMDR, Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing Therapy, is an effective treatment for trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. She is a trained EMDR clinician and uses this in her clinical practice. In her spare time, Anne likes to travel, hike, play the ukulele, and has recently discovered dragon boat paddling. I'd like to know more about that. Um, she has lived in South Bay her whole life, except for four years in Norway and four years in Hawaii. Please welcome Anne. Can you hear me okay? Good evening. Thank you so much, Christine. It's my pleasure to present a very brief overview of EMDR therapy. But before I begin, I would like to confess something to you all, and that is when I was originally asked to give this talk at the cancer support community. I have to admit I had butterflies. But when I found out it was going to be here at Torrance Memorial, videotaped, available online, this is my reaction, <laughs> terror. So I quickly got on the phone and made an appointment with an EMDR therapist myself. So what is EMDR? Well, it stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. It was originated and developed by Dr. Francine Shapiro. Uh, she was taking a walk by this beautiful lake in Los Gatos, California in 1987 and she was thinking some troubling thoughts. And before she knew it, her eyes began to move in a back and forth diagonal direction. And pretty soon those thoughts were no longer troubling. So she thought, well, this is really odd. So she tried to think of some other disturbing thoughts. The same thing happened. Her eyes began to move back and forth in a diagonal direction, and those thoughts were no longer troubling. So EMDR was born. So over the next 30 years, it's been thoroughly researched and tested. It's been tested on combat veterans, victims of loss, abuse, terrorism, and national disasters. It's recommended and endorsed by the World Health Organization, the American uh, Psychiatric Association, National Institute of Mental Health, Department of Defense Veteran Affairs. So in a study with Vietnam veterans, 78% no longer had symptoms of PTSD after 12 sessions, and there were no dropouts. 
So for single event PTSD, the average would be five sessions. For co complex PTSD, the average would be eight to 12. EMDR and cancer. Dr. David Servan Schreiber, who was a neuropsychiatrist, he wrote an excellent book, Anti-Cancer, A New Way of Life. And he found that previous childhood and adult traumas, that it can cause learned helplessness and hopelessness in people. So he began to offer EMDR systematically to his cancer patients. And this is a direct quote from him. Although relieving a patient of the pain of trauma is not a treatment for cancer, it often enables natural defenses to recover their strength, which can aid in the fight against disease. So what happens when a client comes in for EMDR? Well, the AIP system is explained, and that stands for Adaptive Information Processing. So we all have this amazing brain-body system that helps us adapt to the ups and downs of life 24-7. So imagine for a moment you're driving to work on a rainy day and you just about, within millimeters, rear end the car in front of you. Very disturbing. So the AIP kicks in with adaptation and learning and you learn that what you thought was a safe distance, you need an even safer distance and also to avoid heartbreaking. So when the AIP system is overwhelmed due to trauma, that's when it is dysfunctionally stored and there's a log jam in the neural network. So EMDR uses bilateral stimulation to unlock that log jam and enable the AIP to process the trauma that you've experienced. So clients wanting EMDR may be coming in with panic attacks, depression, fear of crowds, open spaces, or difficulty with the intimate touch of a loving partner. So they're met with assurance that they cannot fail and that they are always in control. There are eight phases to EMDR therapy. Patient history, preparation, assessment, desensitization, installation of a positive belief, body scan, closure, and reevaluation. So in phase one, when we're taking the history, the therapist is listening for possible targets for the EMDR. So here we have an example of a 65-year-old woman, and she's terrified of retiring. And we see that at age 60, she went through a very troublesome divorce. At 52, she was diagnosed and treated for breast cancer. But here we notice at age seven, she was tied up by her brother and two of his friends and left alone just for fun. So in phase two, that's the preparation phase. And the client is taught relaxation techniques, breathing techniques, and also to practice visualizing a safe, calm place. And then they will come up with a cue word so that this experience can be brought up as needed. So here you see the tall, abiding, safe trees of Sequoia National Park, and the cue word is trees. In assessment, that's when we actually choose the event to target for the EMDR. So say, for example, it was a horrible car accident. And then we ask the client to think of the worst part, think of the image. So it may be the crushing or the crunching of the metal. It may be screams of children in the back seat. So the negative belief may be, um, we're not gonna survive. Um, it's my fault, I'm powerless. We also ask the client to think of a positive belief. What would you like to have thought in that situation, thinking of the worst part? I'm powerful. We're going to be safe. Thinking of the worst part, what were the emotions that you felt? Terror, fear, body scan. What were you feeling in your body at that worst moment? SUDS would be a measurement that we take before we start the EMDR. How disturbing was this incident for you? Zero, not disturbing. Ten, extremely disturbing. Metaphor and stop sign. So we tell the client, you are safe in this office, that the images that come up during desensitization, they've already happened. There is nothing that is new that is going on right now. So it helps to choose a metaphor. So we ask the client, would you like to think of yourself on a train with the images passing by? Would you like to think of yourself in a movie theater watching it on the screen? Or perhaps you would prefer to think of yourself in a car going through a dark tunnel 
and passing through as quickly as you can. So most people choose the train. Stop sign, um, if the client needs a break in the processing, we ask them to indicate with a gesture or with the word stop because the client is always in control. Container, that would be if images come up during the desensitization that don't belong to that target event that we chose, then we ask the client to imagine a container that would hold it safe so that we could process it, process it at another time. So that could be um, a bank vault, it could be a file cabinet with a key that would hold it secure. Okay, so the next phase, the fourth phase is the desensitization, the EMDR. So the client will choose the type of bilateral stimulation that they're comfortable with. So the gold standard would be the hand passes that maybe some of you are familiar with, with the direction, follow my hand or my fingers with your eyes. Okay. If that's not comfortable, we have headphones with the sound that goes back and forth. We have handheld electrodes with a comfortable vibration. Or the client may elect to have the therapist tap on the outside of their knees. If the client does not tolerate the closeness, the proximity of the therapist, then there is a new technique called artistic flow created by Mark Odland. So the client is looking at a detailed picture of art with the direction thinking of the worst part of the event, allow your eyes to move back and forth, noticing the details. So when the client has chosen the type of bilateral stimulation that they're comfortable with, the bilateral stimulation begins. So the client will think about the worst part of the incident, what were the emotions you were feeling, what was the negative belief, and um, this bilateral stimulation will begin for a certain interval. The therapist will check in from time to time and ask, what are you noticing now? The client will answer, and the therapist will say, notice that or go with that. So there's very little talking that goes back and forth. Installation of the positive belief. So the um, bilateral stimulation will continue until the level what comes down from a 10 to zero or time is up for that phase. The client is asked to think of the worst part and how true is that positive belief now? I am safe, I am powerful, it's not my fault. If the disturbance has come down from a 10 to zero to two, oftentimes the client will say, oh, it's a seven, it's totally true. Body scan. So the next phase would be body scan, checking in with the client. What are you feeling in your body now? So if it's clear, we move on to the next phase. If not, and we have time, we'll go ahead and continue processing. Closure, we'll debrief with the client about that session. And then we'll take time for that calm, safe place so that the client will leave with a feeling of peace and safety. Reevaluation happens at the next appointment, and we assess if the previous trauma was resolved or if it requires additional processing. So just to summarize, we have this natural brain-body system that helps us adapt and grow with the ups and downs in life. And when that system is overwhelmed, the trauma is dysfunctionally stored. So EMDR is a very effective therapy to help unlock those pathways and allow this fearful trauma, this fearful event to become a story that can be told without disturbing emotions. So to find an EMDR therapist, the easiest way would be to go to the website, and that's um, www.emdrinternationalassociation.org. And remember the client that was fearful of retiring? Well, her EMDR was successful and she's happily retired. And finally, this is a picture of my safe, calm place. So this is Kaimana Beach on Oahu in Hawaii. And my cue word is turtle. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was very helpful. OK, next we have. Last but not least, by far, Nancy Lomibo. And um, Nancy is a license, is, has been licensed as a marriage and family therapist since 2000. She earned her master's of science degree from Cal California State University, Dominguez Hills, in marriage 
family and children counseling. Okay. She is currently a doctoral student enrolled at the Uni California Southern University working toward her doctorate degree in clinical psychology. Nancy has worked at Cancer Support Community Redondo Beach since 2014 and is the program director and chief clinical director. She oversees the programs that support cancer patients, their loved ones, and provides psychosocial support. This includes group and individual counseling, mind-body classes, and educational classes. She has some really great classes. Nancy has an extensive background working with victims of domestic violence and abused children in both residential and non-residential settings. She is trained through the Department of Mental Health to provide evidence-based practices for treatment of children and adults. Nancy has lived in the South Bay her entire life. She is married with two children. She teaches art, making jewelry, and shopping. Please welcome Nancy. We'll have questions at the end, okay? After Nancy. Thank you. Thank you. My air. Yeah. Nancy's presentation. So, if you are wondering why there is a doggy here tonight, it's because I'm going to briefly talk about a complementary intervention and technique using animals. And so tonight it's animal assisted therapy for PTSD. And I brought along my sidekick. Uh, this is Harley. Harley is a one and a half year old Palm Chi. He is half Pomeranian and half Chihuahua. And he is about six pounds. So this is Harley. Uh, but I'm going to, to talk a little bit about how using animals can help with some of the PTSD type symptoms and if you notice we wanted we had Dr. Ellers talk about the overview of PTSD we had Crystal talk about the psychosocial support uh, Ann Corinne Nelson spoke to a treatment modality EMDR and I'm talking about a, a complementary addition that all assists with PTSD so that right there is Harley on my desk. He hangs out with me at work. Animal assisted therapy, it's a therapeutic intervention that incorporates animals, so it could be horses, dogs, cats, pigs, etc., into the treatment plan, and it's used to enhance and complement the benefits of traditional therapy. So I tend to use a therapy model uh, called Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, or CBT, in the work that I do. And I incorporate Harley into the work that I do. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in just a bit. So uh, animals, they provide a sense of calm, comfort, and safety. They can help divert attention away from stressful situations and towards ones that provide pleasure. Uh, advocates of animal assisted therapy say that developing a bond with an animal can help people develop a better sense of self-worth, trust, stabilize their emotions, and improve their communication, self-regulation, and socialization skills. So there's been a lot of recent research studies looking at animals, and in particular, and in particular, working with cancer patients, and I'm going to reference some of these. So in canine-assisted therapy, the dogs, are they interact with the clients in, in animal-assisted interventions. And that's what I have training in, um, is animal-assisted interventions. So I use Harley to help with therapeutic activities 
um, that, are, that help with physical, cognitive, behavioral, and social emotional functionings of clients. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, but the dogs help to comfort clients through body contact. And they also help to keep clients um, calm when they're talking about traumatic things like cancer, like their scans, like their processes, feelings, interactions with others. They help patients engage um, and improve motor skills, and that's what leads to them beginning to trust in relationships with others. And due to those benefits, canine-assisted therapy, it's used as a complement to other therapies to treat uh, diagnoses such as PTSD, attention deficit disorder, autism spectrum disorder, and dementia. So those are the four that it's most commonly used with. What the studies have found is that the, using animals can decrease anxiety and blood pressure, and this is through lowering their levels of the stress hormone cortisol, has indirect effects, um, which is increasing the social interactions and their overall participation in everyday events and activities. They've found that six neurotransmitters that influence our mood, that make us feel happy, are actually released after just 15 minutes of interacting with animals. They've also been able to look at those neurochemicals uh, that are released, and they're seeing that biologically that the dog's assistance can mediate the oxytocin in our body, and that's what affects our social and physical well-being by decreasing blood pressure and actually shown with cancer patients to decrease pain um, in several different studies. So the, the benefits of animals focus mainly on dogs and human interactions, and the presence of an animal can alleviate intrusive symptoms, and those are some of the intrusive thoughts and thinking that goes along with PTSD. It, it helps also with um, providing the social benefit of providing a companion. People are more likely to engage when they're with the dog. They're more likely to smile. Um, they're more likely to talk to other people in the room when a dog is present. So just in summary, because that was rather wordy, it, it's just that they de it decreases pain. A dog will help lower stress levels. There's a calming effect, improving mood, decreasing anxiety, decreasing psychological distress, fatigue, a decreased loneliness and social isolation, a sense of emotional connection, and pet therapy may even enhance the will to live. So all of these studies have looked at all of these things that are, have become beneficial now to the cancer patient who's in the, in the room working with a therapist. So this is a study that on, uh, on radiation therapy patients found that, uh, or it's a study on radiation therapy patients, and it found that those people who had dog visits rated their health as better than those who did not have dog visits as part of their therapy. And another study that noted that pet therapy during chemotherapy improved depression as well as blood oxygenization um, basically the amount of oxygen that was carried to the brain. This was a study that basically looked at 42 patients in a hospital in New York, and they were um, oral head and neck cancer patients, which is a very difficult um, treatment. They received both radiation chemotherapy and the patient and the dogs interacted while the patient was either waiting or undergoing treatment. They were surveyed and evaluated their physical, emotional, social, and functional well-being and uh, while undergoing treatment with the therapy dog visits. And the results showed that because of the effects of chemotherapy and radiation, their physical and functional well-being declined over the course of treatment However, both their social and emotional well-being significantly improved over time with the visits. 
The improvement was especially remarkable considering the corresponding decline in their physical well-being. So the chemo and radiation was making them feel worse and worse, but the patient showed an enthusiasm for the therapy dog visits over the course of treatment, even as the treatments themselves made the patients more physically uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> this is, so the authors of the study report many positive comments about the therapy visits from the patient, the therapy dog visits from the patients, and noted that even, that some even maintained contact with the dogs after their participation of the study ended. This is, um, this is actually uh, one of our facilitators, and this is Harley, of course, and Jessica uh, herself had leukemia and went through a stem cell transplant, and so one of the things that she has reported is just having Harley there at the office brings her a lot of comfort and relaxation and helps to keep her calm throughout the course of the day when she's working with cancer patients. Um, so I wanted to talk really briefly about how I use Harley in my work at Cancer Support Community. He comes into the office two to three times a, a week. He hangs out in my office, usually on my desk, like that picture showed. He's there to comfort everybody, the staff, the facilitators, the, the participants. He will currently go into support groups, our grief groups our kids and teens groups, and he allows um, anybody to hold him and pet him and, and talk to him. Sometimes he gets a little antsy. He's still, um, still a baby, he's still a year and a half. He's still got a lot of puppy in him. But there's something about when he goes into the room, he usually will settle down in somebody's lap and allow them to pet him. He also participates in individual counseling. So he'll go into some of the sessions when uh, both adults and children are needing some added support or just wanting to hold him and pet, by petting him and talking with him, it helps keep them kind of calm and focused. Um, so some of the, the interventions that I might use if I bring him into a group is something along the lines of, what do you want Harley to know about your cancer? So I might go into one of the kids or, or teens group and, and they'll be in a circle and talking about, you know, what do you want Harley to know? And so it's taking the direct focus away from the therapist or the facilitator asking that and it's allowing for them to talk to the dog. Um, another question, can you tell ha Harley how you're feeling today? Um, so Harley, he assists with movements and interactions. He plays fetch, so I've taught him to fetch something and retrieve it. And he does things, uh, he'll do tricks for treats. Um, he'll lay down, he'll roll over. Um, he'll choose a hand if you put a treat in a hand and have him guess he'll paw at the hand until he gets it right he'll also if you take um, two pieces of paper and this is a game sometimes we play when uh, kids or teens have to make a choice about um, what game do we want to play we'll write down you know the ungame on one piece of paper and uh, monopoly on the other and we'll throw two pieces of crumpled up paper and he'll go and choose one and bring it back and then that'll be the choice for what we're doing. But I wanted to talk just real um, specifically in regards to one client that I'm seeing and the mother gave me permission to talk about her. She's a six-year-old girl with a, a brain tumor and she underwent radiation and chemotherapy and basically had difficulty with walking, her coordination, her, her movement. So all of those things were really important for Harley to pl play fetch with her to be able to, you know, her throw something, him retrieve it, she would have to walk after him. So the movement was really important. But what was also important is she would have to go in for her treatment and of course they would have to reopen her port and that was the the worst part of having to go in and receive her treatment 
So adults would talk very sweet and nice to her and then poke her. <laughs> and so she had a lot of fears uh, about adults in general in any time she went someplace. So uh, one of the things that she acted out with Harley in the room, um, and she did this for several sessions in a row, is she would put on a, a little collar that we had in a doctor's kit, and it, she called it the chemo collar. And so she would basically give Harley chemo. And in this doctor's kit, there was also a, a shot or an injection. And so she would pretend to give Harley an injection. And she would give him medicine. We always had water in there. So she would pour the medicine into a spoon. And Harley was very accommodating. He licked up all the water every time. Um, but she was acting out and acting through what was her trauma um, and was able to use Harley as the vehicle to talk about it. So then I would be able to interject things um, like, what do you think Harley's feeling right now? Do you think Harley's fe feeling scared about having to have his shot? Or asking follow-up questions in regards to, is, what does this medicine taste like? Is this yucky medicine or does this medicine taste okay? Do you think it'll make him sleepy? Or, you know, so being able to process through what she was going through, through the use of the dog, um, really helped her make some great strides in both her movement as well as psychologically. So that is kind of a, a um, a most recent example of how I've been using Harley. Um, there's different types of working dogs, and I just wanted to point this out because you probably heard there's service dogs, right? And those are specific dogs that um, they're specialized support related to a physical, mental, or psychological disability. They need to perform a task in order to be certified as a service dog. Then we hear a lot about emotional support animals. They provide psychological relief, and they don't require any specialized training, but they do, rely, they do require a letter from either a therapist or a doctor um, that indicates that they need this emotional support dog to help with their anxiety or stress. And then there's therapy animals. And those are the ones that provide therapeutic support um, with counselors or therapists. And that is, Harley is actually, believe it or not, all three of those things because he started out as a service dog for my son. Um, and his neurologist also provided the emotional support animal letter for him. But because my son wasn't taking him to school, I thought, I'll take him to work with me. And that's when he started acting in uh, the therapeutic environment at Cancer Support Community. So um, this is a, something I thought was a little funny. Don't tell me you're OK. You're not OK. I can smell the hurt inside you. Don't walk away from me. Talk to me. And it says, beware of emotional support dogs. Um, and there has been quite a bit in the news and and media about, uh, here it says, less popular emotional support animals, because of course you, people brought on a peacock, and, but this one there's a, says, a sea cucumber, surprisingly unpleasant, and a tarantula, just no, and an elephant exceeds the carry-on weight limit of most airlines, right? Um, and then of course, it's my emotional support bar cart. So how far are they going to go in terms of allowing uh, animals onto the airplane? But my personal belief and how I feel is that if, you do, if you're doing this for the right reasons, if you want to have your own emotional support animal, and you're doing it because they really do help provide a level of comfort and de-stress, um, then that's something, it, it's for instance, in my private practice that if I've seen somebody for six or 10 sessions, I may provide a letter for them. What, what we hear is people who want a letter for an emotional support animal because they want to take it on an airplane or a trip, 
or they want to be able to be in an apartment, something along those lines, and have a dog where the apartment doesn't allow it. Um, so for, for cancer patients, you can interact with dogs both at settings that have a therapy dog, an animal, hospitals and treatment centers that bring in a dog to walk around, and you can also consider your own uh, emotional support animal if you think that the benefits would benefit you and your symptoms. So there's Harley and his his Aloha Friday Hawaiian outfit. That's my uh, contact information. And thank you so much for your attention tonight. Thank you, Nancy and Harley. Yes. Um, thank you, and thank you all for coming. Um, if we have, I don't know if we have, we're over time. So if you do have a question, we have our speakers here. And um, is that okay? Is that okay? And they can answer your questions directly. Dr. Ellers, may it was in the back, but um, if you have, um, thank you all for coming. Please don't forget to do your um, evaluation form. And we hope to see you in the spring to 2020. Okay, thank you. Thank you to all our speakers.